Join me, 48 Hours Correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Greetings one and all, Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for listening to the China History Podcast. And in this penultimate episode of the CHP series, we're continuing on with some of the main events and figures from the history of Taiwan. We might end up jumping around in this episode, 1980s, 90s, and into the 2000s. Hope you don't mind. Following the death of Jiang Qingguo on January 13th, 1988, many things began to happen that would have been unthinkable in earlier times. As we saw last episode, 182 days prior to his death, Jiang Jingguo called for the end of martial law in Taiwan. And now, for the first time, Bun Shengren, the native Taiwanese who didn't support the KMT, they had other real options. And this, of course, led to the emergence of the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, one of the two main political parties in Taiwan politics, and not the only two. The earliest pioneers whose sacrifices led to the founding of the DPP on September 28, 1986, had all gotten plowed under in the 1950s and 60s. We saw how beginning in the 1970s, after all these previous sacrifices, and especially during the 1980s, thanks in part to those dissidents who lip-synced to the Deng Wai movement, There became this sense of inevitability about the end of one-party rule on Taiwan and where Taiwan might go from there. And along with the end of one-party rule came a period of reconciliation. And this task of taking the first steps initially fell to President Li Tenghui. As you might guess, the first matters that got scrutinized were the 228 incident and the White Terror. The time had come, belatedly, but it came where the whole matter was investigated, witnesses called, testimony given, reports written, and compensation paid. Investigations were held first, but no formal KMT apology was issued. That came later, once again, from Li Tenghui on February 28, 1995, the 48th anniversary of the unmentionable incident in Taiwan history. In his speech, President Lee said regarding 228, quote, Today the families of the victims will listen with their own ears as I, as a public servant of the country, accept the responsibilities of the government's past mistakes and offer my deepest apologies, End quote. Not long after this historic apology, the April 7, 1995, 228 Incident Disposition and Compensation Act went into effect. The act called for, quote, dealing with compensation matters, enhancing citizen knowledge of the truth behind the incident, pacifying historical wounds, and fostering ethnic integration, end quote. As is most often the case, despite the effort being made, the speed with which the past suffering of those seeking redress was agonizingly slow. As far as the white terror was concerned, Efforts were also made to heal those wounds as well. Families of victims who were disappeared or incarcerated or executed on dubious charges, they were given a formal channel to seek compensation. In 1998, the Compensation Foundation for Improper Verdicts was created. And over the next 16 years, this foundation would handle over 10,000 claims, accepting almost 80% of them. In all... 20,340 people received compensation. 
Taipei New Park was renamed 228 Peace Memorial Park. That's the location from which Li Donghui gave his apology speech. There are also a number of monuments around Taiwan that were built for the benefit of future generations to remember that this happened, even if the government, for so many decades, said it didn't. So that was one of the manifestations of post-Jiang, post-martial law Taiwan. When martial law was first lifted in 1987, there were still some tripwires left in place to try and ease the transition. The main meat of martial law restrictions still lingered a while longer. It wasn't a case of one day it was there and the next day it was gone. I'd like to start talking about cross-strait relations and look at a few tidbits that might shed some light on many of the issues we read and hear about today. 1987 was a historic year on Taiwan, not only for the formal ending of martial law. Something else happened that signaled a new state of affairs between the PRC and Taiwan. One of the first signs of a possible thaw in relations was the allowing of old KMT soldiers to return to the mainland to Tanqin. Tanqin means to go back to your homeland to visit your relatives. And in November of that year, 1987, laws were passed that also made it easier for certain categories of Chinese, such as professionals and scholars, to visit Taiwan. Actually, there were many Taiwanese who went to China to get higher education, going back as early as 1979. These degrees weren't recognized by Taiwan institutions, but a path was opening in small ways that was allowing for innocuous things like educational and cultural exchanges to take place. Reform and opening on the mainland depended highly on outside investors becoming part of all the excitement. Taiwanese export manufacturers had already gone through the whole drill back in the 60s and 70s, and Taiwanese manufacturers and investors were welcome to bring that experience and expertise to China. When I was there in the 1990s, Taiwan businessmen, technicians, QC staff, factory bosses were all over China. Before all that could happen, there had to be agreements in place to control all this. But again, you know how it is. Appearances had to be kept up regarding the whole non-recognition thing, and workarounds had to be figured out. And the geniuses in Beijing and Taipei, they came up with the idea of setting their differences aside regarding the grand issue of, you know, who was the representative of China, for the sake of addressing more pressing and practical matters that needed to be worked out. And the way they did this was by utilizing proxies to represent each other's respective negotiating positions. Using this model that came with a built-in fig leaf to cover the main issue allowed the two sides to negotiate and work things out, yet, again, not recognizing each other's existence. In November 1990, the Taiwan side set up the Straits Exchange Foundation, the SEF. Later, in December 1991, China set up the Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Straits. And much later on, these two organizations pinch hit for their respective leaderships and managed to sign 23 agreements between 2008 and 2015, covering all manners of practical, everyday stuff that went a long way to provide conveniences and benefits to both sides. And I'll get to that in a bit. These two sides, the SEF and ARATS, met first in Beijing in March 1992, and again in Hong Kong at the end of October. A lot of the early discussions involved splitting and re-splitting hairs about protocols and procedures, and nothing was not considered from every conceivable angle by both sides. During the Hong Kong meeting of these two sides, there occurred what became known as the 1992 Consensus. Maybe you've heard that term before. It was imperative that both sides clear the logjam as far as settling the basic question that there was only one China. Easy for you and me to say, but for the negotiators of the SEF and ARATS, these two words, one China, were loaded with substance below the surface and had to be couched in accompanying language. No one wanted to put anything in writing. The China side advised, let's agree to make oral statements. 
In the end, the Taiwan side, rather than say yes or no or state a fact, settled the matter to mutual satisfaction by saying their position was in line with what had been agreed to at the August 1992 ROC National Unification Council that, quote, both sides of the strait insist on the principle of one China, but the two sides have different views regarding its meaning, end quote. The Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Straits was okay with that response, and from there, they were able to move forward. They replied by agreeing, quote, Both sides of the Taiwan Strait insist on the principle of one China, seeking the unification of the nation, but the functional negotiations of cross-straits matters do not involve the political meaning of one China. A Taiwan politician named Su Qi called this formula, one China, respective interpretations. Yiga Zhongguo, Guzi Biao Shu. It was purposely vague, but meaty enough to serve as a mechanism allowing for improved cross strait relations. Now, hidden inside the so called 1992 consensus is a small point concerning an implicit understanding that Taiwan was part of China, and therefore no talk of independence would be considered. Now, not too long ago, in October 2017, at the 19th Party Congress, Xi Jinping had said, quote, The 1992 consensus embodies the one China principle and defines the fundamental nature of cross-strait relations, end quote. So you can see where the People's Republic stands on this matter. China was deep into reform and opening at this time. They were trying to recreate the Taiwan miracle on the mainland. Therefore, it was a win-win by allowing all this Taiwanese investment, technology, raw materials, and expertise into the country. So it started off good, but then came 1995, when the U.S. State Department granted Li Donghui a visa to enter the U.S. to give a speech at Cornell, his alma mater, in June. Because Li had recently been treated shabbily by the U.S. government on a stopover in Honolulu, being forced to spend the night on his plane... And because of this indignity, the U.S. Congress was all over the president to allow the State Department to issue the visa. Clinton knew, and turned out to be right, that by allowing Li Donghui into the country to give this speech, that was all about Taiwan's successes with democratization, mind you, there was going to be trouble. And Clinton insisted to his own government that the whole matter overstepped the bounds of the unofficial relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. The matter whether or not to grant Li Donghui a visa was put to a vote in the House and passed 396 to 0 in favor of granting the visa. It also overwhelmingly passed in the Senate. Therefore, Clinton had no choice, and in June 1995, Li Donghui came to the U.S. and the speech went ahead. And the fact that we allowed the president of Taiwan to come to the U.S. and give a speech after all the agreements and communiques, and everything else that had been signed, not to mention China always calling out the U.S. over these arms sales. This whole matter ruffled some serious feathers and led to the third Taiwan Strait crisis. So this was followed by six ballistic missile launches near Taiwan in July and more frightening live fire exercises in August, right off the coast of Taiwan. The halted cross-strait talks wouldn't resume until October 1998, and even so, only for a short time. If not for that speech at Cornell, thanks to that, it led to the predictable PRC response with missile tests, military exercises, and the propaganda machine running 24-7 at full throttle. So this third Taiwan Strait crisis, it lasted from July 1995 to March 1996. Besides the American government granting the visa and, of course, all the arms sales that seemed to never let up, there was one other matter that was riling the China government up. This concerned all this democratization going on in Taiwan and this pragmatic diplomacy being carried out. It all looked like nothing more than a prelude to independence. In response to Chinese actions, once again, U.S. aircraft carriers and battle groups were ordered to begin sailing through the Taiwan Strait, signaling to both sides not to escalate this any further. China continued to show defiance, but militarily, things quieted down until the March 23rd direct presidential election. The final stage of this 
eight-month crisis in the Taiwan Strait took place just prior to this 1996 Taiwanese presidential election. This election was historic because this was the first direct presidential election. Prior to 1996, it was always the National Assembly who would select the president. Now, for the first time, voters were directly choosing from among a number of choices representing many constituencies. So, this was a big deal. And over on the mainland, this kind of thing, direct elections, they didn't welcome it at all. And besides that, China's leaders detested Li Donghui, running as the KMT candidate, and the former dissident, Peng Mingmin, who we talked about in Part 12, Well, he ran as the DPP's candidate. And in China, they were no fans of him either. They knew how Peng and the DPP felt about them. So to hopefully persuade the voters of Taiwan not to cast their ballots for Li Donghui or Peng Mingmin, missile tests and military exercises were, again, carried out from March 8th to March 15th, just before Election Day. All this blasting away was carried out near to Penghu and just within ROC territorial waters off Qilong and Kaohsiung, defying Taiwan, and it was hoped, intimidating voters to not support the KMT or DPP candidates. But China ended up committing an own goal in that the intended results from intimidation by these live-fire exercises and missile tests ended up having the opposite effect of giving Li Donghui a bit of a bump and served as another brick in the wall of shaky Taiwan-China relations. Li Donghui ended up winning the election, receiving 54% of the votes compared to Peng's 21%. The rest of the votes went to two other candidates. And not long after, these freezing relations had just about thawed out. Cross-strait relations took another monumental hit when, in 1999, President Li Donghui referred to Taiwan-China relations as a, quote, special state-to-state relationship. Well, they did not like that in Zhongnanhai. State-to-state? Who said? That went against what had already been mutually agreed to. But just prior to that tempest, in June-July 1998, President Clinton went to China. Jiang Zemin was still party secretary. And it was during this visit that Clinton uttered his famous three no's. No Taiwan independence, no two Chinas, or one Taiwan, one China, and no membership for Taiwan in any intergovernmental organizations. This was, of course, music to China's ears. But the 21 million or so people living on Taiwan were wondering, why did he have to go and say that publicly? And Taiwan's friends in the media and the U.S. government vowed to make hay out of this rhetorical flourish by the president of the U.S. After enough outrage had been registered by Clinton's enemies and other Taiwan supporters in the government, the White House was quick to add a wide range of footnotes and asterisks to the president's three no's that he uttered at this gathering in Shanghai during the China visit. All he was trying to do was send a signal to Jiang Zemin that, you know, he was still all in with the one China policy and, you know, don't worry about those arms sales. So Li Donghui's remarks about the China-Taiwan relationship being one of state-to-state relations was only one of the earthquakes that happened in 1999. There was another one that happened in Taiwan on September 21st, 1999, and this was the Jiji earthquake. I mentioned about this natural disaster way back in the beginning in part one. This was a 7.3 quake that happened around 10 minutes to 2 in the morning, right about in the geographic center of the island of Taiwan in Jiji in west-central Nanto County, slightly west of Sun Moon Lake. 2,415 people were killed, 11,300 injured, 100,000 made homeless, The one I mentioned in uh, Part 7 that happened in 1935, well, that was the worst one of all time. But this one in Jiji was the second worst. The Xinju Science Park, west of the epicenter, had to shut down for six days. There was a tremendous international response to the earthquake, and many nations sent aid and rescue teams. The KMT had to take its lumps following the investigations and the predictable revelations of shoddy building materials being used to cut costs and the corruption associated with allowing this to happen. 
The government response to dealing with the aftermath of the earthquake, including the rescue phase, fell under a lot of criticism. Whether or not that contributed to the 83% turnout to the 2000 election, well, it's not known for sure. In 1999, the DPP also had a milestone in their history. This was a document released called The Resolution on Taiwan's Future, the Taiwan Qiantu Jueyiwen. The resolution proclaimed that Taiwan was a sovereign and independent country, not part of the People's Republic. And because of this, Taiwan should actively seek recognition, including UN membership, and carry out relations with other countries. It also went on to state that Taiwan should also renounce the One China policy. And at the same time, China should actively engage with the PRC to carry out a comprehensive dialogue with the goal of seeking mutual understanding. So rather than the kind of smoke and mirrors that everyone was used to by this time, this May 1999 resolution on Taiwan's future came right out and openly said what was mostly not meant to be openly said. So the DPP, all its earliest founders, members, and people who supported them, this was how they felt. They always did. And finally, in 1999, they put it down in writing so that everyone could see where they stood. 1999 also heralded the Taiwan Security Enhancement Act. President Clinton's three no's and pro-China slant, that got sufficient enough pushback whereby House Republicans and pro-Taiwan Democrats wanted to pass this bill in order to accelerate arms sales and military training to Taiwan. So over in China, they were predictably fuming about this. Even Clinton found it way too provocative and promised to veto it if it passed. The Senate, too. They weren't on board either. Despite a House vote of 341 to 70 in favor, in the end, Congress withdrew it. It was historic when, upon the death of Jiang Jingguo, Li Donghui became the first Taiwan-born person to become ROC president. Well, history was made again in the Taiwan presidential election of 2000 when DPP candidate Chen Shui-bian became the fifth president of the Republic of China. Chen was also one of the co-founders of the DPP and had served as Taipei mayor from 1994 to 98. What was special about Chen Shui-bian? Well, besides the fact that when his second term as president ended in 2008, he was arrested and put in prison for corruption. Aside from that, he was the first person to serve as president of the ROC who wasn't a KMT member. And if you recall from part 13, Chen Shui-bian achieved some earlier prominence as one of the defense attorneys for the Kaohsiung 8. The 2000 election had Chen Shui-bian and running mate Annette Liu on the DPP ticket and Lian Chan and Vincent Xu running as KMT candidates. There were also maybe a half dozen other smaller parties participating, and James Song ran as an independent. James Song was a mainlander and KMT supporter who had come to Taiwan during the Great Retreat. He was one of the major politicians of the time and had been instrumental in grooming Li Donghui for his rise in the KMT and getting him elected. He went on to form the People's First Party, the Qin Ming Dang. Just prior to the 2000 election, Song had a falling out with the KMT and he ended up running as an independent. And that was important because by running as an independent candidate, Song ended up splitting the KMT vote, and this facilitated Chen Shui-bian's historic victory, narrowly winning 39.3% of the vote against 36.84% for James Song and 23.1% for Lian Chan. Fifty-five years of continuous KMT rule on Taiwan going back to the end of World War II came to an end in this 2000 election. Chun's vice president, Annette Liu, Liu Xiolan, she had been one of the Kaohsiung Eight and had been sentenced to 12 years in prison for her role in that December 10th, 1979 Human Rights Day demonstration. Thanks in part to the legendary NYU law professor and China scholar Jerome Cohen, Annette Liu was able to get an early release in 1985, serving less than half of her sentence. And prior to all that, she was part of the Dang Wai movement and a contributor to Formosa magazine. 
Annette Liu was also an outspoken feminist throughout her political career. And thanks to the outcome of the 2000 presidential election, this longtime political dissident and crusader for women's rights became the vice president of the Republic of China. And when Chen Shui-bian was running for re-election in 2004, Annette Liu remained his running mate. And just prior to the vote, they were both shot at a rally in Tainan. Fortunately, they survived. Regarding cross-strait relations, during his second term, Chen Shui-bian uttered his famous si bu yi meo, the four no's and the one without. Right in his inaugural speech, Chen Shui-bian came right out and said, as long as the PRC had no plans to invade Taiwan and attempt a military takeover, his government promised not to declare independence or change the name from Republic of China to the Republic of Taiwan. Chen also promised he would not adopt the Yibian Yiguo doctrine that when stripped bare was another way of pronouncing one China, one Taiwan. And lastly, Chen said there would not be any referendums held concerning the matter of Taiwan independence. And the one without concerned the matter of the National Unification Council. Now, this was a body whose raison d'etre was to keep the discussion going regarding peaceful unification and to be pointed at by both sides as living proof that the goal of reunification was alive and well. So Chen Shui-bian was saying in the one without that he wouldn't shut this down and would keep it going, but it ended up getting shuttered anyway in early 2006. The four no's, ladies and gentlemen, and they were, as I said, predicated on China agreeing not to resort to any military force to take Taiwan over. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify... ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation? They can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So, make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. Chen Shui-bian upped the ante in March of 2007 with a new policy called the Four Wants and the One Without, the Si Yao Yi Mei The wants were Taiwan independence, they wanted that, the changing of its name, that is to say, goodbye ROC, hello Republic of Taiwan, and the third Yao was a new constitution to replace the 1947 one, and the fourth want was development. And he further declared that Taiwan politics wasn't about left or right, but only about unification or independence. The eight years of Chen's presidency was filled with rancor and a lot of nasty politics that many of us are familiar with in our own countries. He was pro-independence and very much for disassociating Taiwan from China. He even changed the passport covers from the Republic of China to Taiwan. And during Chen Shui-bian's presidency, Taiwan entered the WTO. This was on January 1st, 2002. At that time, Taiwan was the 14th biggest economy in the world. Today, it's the 22nd largest or thereabouts. The PRC also entered around the same time and gave the nod on allowing Taiwan into the WTO, but... They had to call themselves Chinese Taipei, though officially they are known as the, quote, separate customs territory of Taiwan, Penghu, Jinmen, and Mazu. Chen Shui-bian had his fingerprints on his share of corruption. What was sort of okay in the past was no longer acceptable by the voters, and his enemies took advantage of every fumble made by his administration. Over on the mainland, he was not a popular figure. I vividly recall my old boss always referring to him as Apian, and not in an affectionate use of that moniker. 
In the 2008 election, the KMT returned to power. And this new sixth president of the Republic of China was Ma Yingzhou. Cross-strait relations finally caught a breather. The past eight years under DPP rule was met by the PRC with no small amount of furious anger, to quote Ezekiel 2517. And then after eight years of antagonism, enter Ma Yingzhou. I don't know if you could say his policies on cross-strait relations were the total opposite of his DPP predecessor, but they differed quite a bit. Like Chen Shui-bian, Ma Yingzhou worked his way up the ladder of his party. He was justice minister and Taipei mayor from 1998 to 2006. And Ma Yingzhou tried to patch things up with China. Many of you might think, well, that's a good thing. But as you've seen by now... Not everyone in Taiwan was keen on cozying up to China. Neither did they wish them any ill will, but as far as integrating the two economies, eh, not everyone was so hip on that idea. One of Ma's slogans was, Bu Tong, Bu Du, Bu Wu. No unification, no independence, and no war. However, if unification was able to be achieved peacefully... Ma Yingzhou and many of his constituents wouldn't have minded at all. And remember Li Donghui kicked the hornet's nest by referring to cross-strait relations as state-to-state? And Chen Shui-bian's term was one country on each side? Well, Ma Yingzhou's way of saying the unsayable was special non-state-to-state relations. Where the 1992 consensus was concerned, Ma was all in on that. No disagreements with China on that front. I mentioned how not everybody was thrilled about the prospects of China-Taiwan trade, but on the other side, there were business interests who saw a once-in-a-century opportunity to jet-propel Taiwan's economic growth in an upward trajectory and open the door for all kinds of opportunities for Taiwan's companies. Especially after China's entry to the WTO, there followed a real nice bump in trade turnover. China's economy in the early 2000s was still going nowhere but up, and acting in the capacity of factory to the world, China's demand for raw materials, including high-tech semiconductors and electronic components and man-made fiber textiles, was insatiable, and Taiwan subcontractors and manufacturers raked in some hefty profits. To this group of industrialists and everyone else who benefited from them, they thought, What's wrong with this? One of the centerpieces of Ma Yingzhou's engagement policy with the PRC was his 2010 Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, an agreement that you wouldn't be surprised to know that big businesses in Taiwan were all for. It was a trade agreement at heart. Taiwan and China agreed to set aside the elephant in the room and focus on the win-win matter of trade and investment. The hopes were to take that $197 billion in two-way trade and ratchet that up a little, take advantage of their proximity to each other and shared language. This June 29, 2010 ECFA was just about the biggest thing to happen in cross-strait relations since 1949. But like I said, many on the DPP side and voters as well who were aligned with the Green Coalition platform thought this whole thing was a bad idea. They foresaw all kinds of complications and unintended consequences from the terms of this economic cooperation framework agreement. Their bottom line was that Taiwanese just shouldn't ignore realities. The ECFA, it sure gave a nice boost to two-way trade between Taiwan and China. And there were plenty of winners and losers as well, depending on your profession or other factors. This agreement was followed up with another one that sought to extend the scope of the ECFA to include more financial services and other service-based businesses. And this was called the Cross-Straits Service Trade Agreement. Representatives from China and Taiwan signed it in June 2013. They signed it, but the Taiwan legislature never ratified it. I'm not sure how many of you remember It was about 10 years ago from when I'm recording this. It was called the Sunflower Movement. 
Well, this was a series of student-led protests against the ratification of this cross-strait service trade agreement. It wasn't so much the agreement itself that they objected to, although they did. It was the way the Ma Yingjiu KMT government sort of rammed this through without giving the people or the opposition party any opportunity to scrutinize the details or question its contents. So those in support of this agreement and in support of growing trade relations with China argued this was good for Taiwan. But the DPP and their constituents felt the agreement benefit only those at the top of the corporate pyramid. The small guy got the shaft. The agreement called for 64 sectors of the Taiwan economy to open up to China investment and participation. And some believed eh, there went the neighborhood. And for many small and medium-sized businesses, it ushered in a wave of unwelcome competition. So heated did the protests get on March 18, 2014, protesters actually forced their way into the legislative Yuan building and took over the floor and made a lot of noise and let their grievances be known. And this sunflower movement was the largest student-led protest in Taiwan history. So this cross-strait service trade agreement ended up not getting ratified. Now, it didn't pass due to political pressure and public pushback, but they did allow for a mandate to hold future negotiations as well as establishing a communication mechanism between the two sides regarding these matters. You know, I forgot to mention this earlier, but besides the sunflower, there was another flower movement that happened March 16 to 22, 1990, right at the exact moment Li Denghui was being sworn in. 22,000 demonstrators from National Taiwan University and elsewhere staged a sit-in at a public location and demanded direct elections for president, vice president, and for the National Assembly. And this one was called the Wild Lily Movement, named after the Lilium Formosanum, the Taiwanese lily, Taiwan Bai He. There was a cultural reference in a poem that led to this flower being named their symbol. Li Denghui met with the group and their leaders and promised them their demands would be met in time, and he was going to start on that sooner than they expected. And this Wild Lily Movement was considered another student movement that helped move the needle quite a bit in the direction of reform. And everything they asked for, in time, became a reality. Right after Ma Yingzhou became president, the share price of Taiwan-China relations skyrocketed. A lot of people made a lot of money, and not just Taiwan's biggest corporations. Those who worked for companies engaged in cross-straits trade or investment, they got to enjoy pretty nice careers, made a better than decent living. There was more to gain than there was to lose. And besides, compared to cross-strait relations 55 years before, this was by far the better scenario. In 2005, there were several high-level visits of pan-blue politicians who traveled from Taiwan to China, via Hong Kong, of course. The pan-blue coalition was comprised of KMT members and their political allies. And when they shook hands with their counterparts on the mainland, they became the highest-level party-to-party officials to meet since the two sides last gathered during better days in Chongqing at the end of World War II. It was a pretty big deal and was an event that was one of the marquee moments of Ma Yingzhou's presidency. The Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Strait Chairman, Chen Yunlin, came for a visit to Taiwan on November 3, 2008, and stayed five days. Chen's visit wasn't without protests. Once again, students led the charge with what became known as the Wild Strawberry Movement. To demonstrate their unhappiness that the KMT was hosting the CCP and to show they were not on board and they believed the KMT was taking relations too far, a series of sit-ins were held throughout Taiwan, and it lasted for about a month. This meeting in 2008 between Chen Yunlin and KMT Vice Chairman Jiang Bingkun was the first of its kind in 60 years. That and the March-April 2015 delegation to China, led by KMT Chairman Lian Zhan. He led 70 members, again from the Pan-Blue Coalition, and they had a historic tour and did what they could to build goodwill, blow some wind in future trade and investment projects, and discuss matters of mutual interest. 
But like I've been hinting at here and there, Lian Chan and his delegation, they barely made it out of Chiang Kai-shek International Airport. The protests against their visit to China were very loud and downright violent. They blocked roads to the airport, and it was not at all an easy curbside to ticket counter experience. The protests turned violent, and riot police had to be called in to restore order. The symbolism of this trip was profound. Lian Chan even met with Hu Jintao while he was there, KMT chairman to CCP chairman. And this was exactly the kind of thing that these protesters objected to. And they weren't a fringe part of the political spectrum either. They represented the views of more moderate Taiwanese who thought this 2015 delegation went a little too far. Even Li Danghui said he thought the delegation was undermining Taiwan's sovereignty. So we'll never forget the eight years of Ma ying Jo's presidency from 2008 to 2016 for the years of economic cooperation and growth in cross-strait relations. December 15, 2008, Taiwan and China resumed direct air and sea links. The mail got cranked up again. No longer did all of this have to transit Hong Kong in order to be read by relatives on both sides of the strait. So many raw materials were being shipped from Taiwan to China. Not having to transship through Hong Kong was a godsend for many. But as we've seen, despite all this, this matter regarding all this engagement with China wasn't embraced by all people living on Taiwan. And some were against it more than others. On August 8, 2009, there was a terrible and deadly typhoon that hit South Taiwan just before midnight. This one, Typhoon Morakot, was one of those typhoons with only 80 to 90 mile per hour winds, but it was slow moving and just hovered and soaked the central and southern part of the island. In such a mountainous place as Taiwan, it triggered landslides, mudslides, and destructive flooding. Over a hundred inches of rain fell on Pingtung County. Xiaolin Village, a 90-minute winding drive up the mountains from Tainan, was almost wiped out when a landslide dam burst and a river of mud poured down onto this tiny agricultural village, home of the largest number of native Taiwan people, the Tamanzu. With the complete destruction of their village, the survivors of the Xiaolin mudslide had to relocate to other village areas all due to this worst typhoon in Taiwan's history. 471 of the 1,300 people who lived in Xiaolin Village were killed. The Taiwan people are often credited with being the ones who gave Taiwan its name. It's believed they were the first ones to encounter the Dutch when they arrived on the southeast coast of Taiwan, where the Taiwan people were once based. One theory has it that the name Taiwan came from Taiwan or a community they established called Taiwang. And once again, the KMT had to take that walk of shame after being accused of not rising to the occasion in the immediate emergency response to the disaster. Like it happens and continues to happen, the scale of the destruction was grossly underestimated, which affected the immediate response. And it took some time, but... A lot of heroes came out of this natural disaster. A total of 673 people in Taiwan died. 26 were missing. I remember this particular typhoon because over in Zhejiang province, where my company was, 49 inches of rain fell, and you could imagine the damage done throughout the province. I remember the impact to our operation, and that transport was so badly impacted, I had to fly all over the country begging U.S. retailers to... Give us an extra couple of weeks to ship orders. Despite the heat the KMT took for their initial response to this devastating typhoon, Ma Yingzhou still won re-election in June 2011, beating out Tsai Ing-wen, who was running as the DPP candidate. The KMT ended up winning 51.6% to 45.63% for the DPP. Well, I'm going to close up shop here, and I have a high degree of confidence that come the next episode in part 15, we should be able to finish this series up. I didn't even get to the November 7th, 2015 handshake between Ma Yingzhou and Xi Jinping. We'll get to that next time. May I also extend an apology to my Taiwan-based listeners for making these 
final episodes. A little heavy on the political side. I know that's not everyone's cuppa. A special CHP shout out to my serious CHP listeners, Carrie and Tadzio, Linda and Cam. Always a personal pleasure for your humble narrator to meet people with such impeccable and refined tastes and history podcasts. Okay, I won't even hit anyone up for money or tell you about my support page at teacup.media. We'll just yank down the curtain right here until the next time. Laszlo Montgomery, as always, signing off from Los Angeles on the west coast of these United States, beseeching you, as I am sometimes wont to do, to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.